Okay, well, let's get started. Uh, welcome to Science Circle Island. Welcome to the question and answer Thank session you. on coronaviruses. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Robert Hendricks with us today. Uh, you'll see a tagline there. And my name is Phil Youngblood. I'm a university professor, but I'm uh, in computers and cybersecurity. So I know more about computer viruses and I do research. Uh, there's a display here with us. You can take a look at it in detail. Uh, but the idea for the session today is please ask questions. Please share things that are going on with you or concerns. Uh, please share information you learn here today. Uh, this is something that um, is uh, global. It affects all of us. And so, uh, and remember to stay connected socially. That doesn't mean touching, but it means things like this. So we're glad to be able to uh, sponsor this today before the um, conference begins. Okay, so without further ado, I'll let, turn it over to Dr. Robert Hendricks. And if you have any questions, please ask them in uh, chat, or you can even uh, jump in with voice. If you if English is not your strongest language, then uh, go ahead and ask them in whatever language, and we'll try to sort that out. Again, welcome to Science Circle Island and to this Q and A session on the novel coronavirus. Dr. Hendricks, would you like to say anything? Uh, go ahead, tagline, if you have um, any uh, thing you'd like to share with the audience. I'm sorry, can you hear me now? Uh, yes. Yeah, okay. go ahead. I, I had started talking and I didn't realize it wasn't on. Um, there was a question from the previous session I'd like to address first, actually two, quickly. One was coronavirus seems activated by phosphoric acid to reduce dopamine. Can increasing dopamine reduce brain damage? My answer on that, uh, frankly, I don't know of any medical reports of direct neurological damage from this um, coronavirus, as SARS-CoV-2 or uh, COVID-19. Um, by the way, those two names arose about the same time. I think the WHO named it COVID-19. And then shortly after the um, um, International um, uh, Committee on Taxonomy of Viruses, uh, ICTV, uh, uh, named it uh, SARS-CoV-2. Um, and uh, it's SARS-CoV-1 is the uh, SARS uh, virus from, or SARS for, uh, um, um, uh, acute uh, respiratory distress syndrome um, uh, from 2002, 2003. Those are very similar viruses. They have a similar spike protein uh, that sticks through the envelope of, uh, that gives the corona appearance on electron microscopy. Um, but uh, uh, I'm, I'm rambling a little bit here, but uh, at any rate, those to me, either name is um, interchangeable, although the formal um, official name of it uh, by standards now would be SARS-CoV-2. Um, uh, um, and, so, and from what I read, I think the distinction, as you just mentioned, is that the SARS-CoV-2 is the name of the virus, and then the COVID-19 is the name of the disease. I think that's the way they're breaking it out now. I see. Um, well, it, it's, uh, it wasn't that clear to me, but that I, I think that if one uses either term, 
most anyone's going to know what you're talking about uh, um, uh, as long as they're aware of it. But um, at any rate, in terms of the dopamine and brain damage, I, I think brain damage in these serious cases arises from a uh, cytotoxin storm causing massive, severe inflammation of the lower respiratory tract and uh, influx of fluids and inflammatory cells that fill the alveolar sacs and interfere with gas exchange and uh, technically uh, individuals die of respiratory failure, suffocation. And so I think brain damage would be secondary to anoxia. There was one other quick question um, about um, an individual um, uh, uses a copper vessel to drink from uh, a copper water bottle um, because of the idea that copper would purify the water. And I don't know about that. Copper is a trace metal. It um, has biological function. You don't want too much of it. Uh, I have a copper fountain for birds that I would change the water quite often because I worry about the uh, copper ions uh, being toxic to the birds if I leave it too long. Um, but uh, one uh, element that's used in materials like this that has uh, uh, antibacterial and um, protective effects known since ancient times is silver. And if you want to drink out of a silver cup, um, you'll impress your friends, but uh, that actually might have more bactericidal uh, um, effect. Uh, I don't know that copper would uh, have much in, in protection for you. Uh, I know copper is being used these days in a lot of stuff, uh, like bracelets and things. Um, oh, someone's telling me my is on. So, any other questions? Let's see. Uh, Max asked a question about whether someone who had the earlier SARS, SARS-1, uh, might have some immunity against this one. That is a good question. I don't know. Uh, and um, the um, uh, they are clearly related, but the uh, humoral immunity, which would be the main thing that would protect you, I think, um, humoral immunity, meaning production of, uh, from a, a stimulated, starting off with a naive immune system, it gets stimulated and you go from, uh, um, a uh, new infection or acute infection to a convalescent stage, you get, you produce antibodies like IgM antibodies initially, and then the IgG antibodies for general systemic immunity in your serum. Um, those are against the spike protein. And now MERS uh, is distinct because it, uh, the spike protein on it uh, goes to a different receptor. It goes to um, uh, DPP-4 or diphenyl, uh, di dipeptidyl, uh, peptidase 4, um, which has a gene that codes for it, uh, and those, that's a, a cell membrane receptor, but um, uh, apparently both uh, the SARS-1 uh, and SARS-2 go for the um, um, angiotensin converting enzyme receptor or ACE2 receptor in the lower airways. And it's quite conceivable that there could be some cross immunity. I wouldn't count on it being very much though. And um, I haven't seen anything um, published about that. A lot of what's getting out there right now is from past research and um, uh, recent communications and a lot of things have not been, uh, not had time to get it into the journals. So I bet you that'll come out eventually, but uh, as far as I know, it's not been addressed specifically yet. Okay, there's another question about if someone with um, ulcerative colitis is more susceptible in getting this virus? I think in, 
I would suspect they are. I would suspect they are, but um, especially if there's anything that they are taking for it that might have uh, immunosuppressive effects. Uh, but uh, uh, the same for Crohn's disease, I think. Uh, but um, uh, okay, and the other another question was. Um, Will herd immunity, like we hear with vaccine, eventually defeat the uh, infection? Uh, my understanding of these things is that obviously it has to have a host. <laughs> and as soon as you either remove the host or everybody gets it, uh, that uh, it can't spread. But you're the doctor, so please. Well, I, I, I heard some figures on this that uh, in. Uh, um, and, and they probably arose from modeling, uh, but the um, conclusion uh, someone came to was that if 25% uh, of people in a fixed population isolate, it will reduce, uh, and, and that's supposing that people are mingling uh, casually and not having too many super spreaders, uh, that it will reduce 25% reducing uh, their their exposure uh, markedly will reduce the spread of the infection by 64%. Uh, the take home message is probably that there's a big payoff in any isolation we can get um, between people. Um, it, it's a compounded payoff. Why um, a few cases in Africa uh, I know there's some cases in Nigeria and other places, and I suspect that there are more cases than you would think uh, that aren't recognized at this point. Uh, they're testing everyone in Iceland, and they found that 50% um, of the positives are asymptomatic. Oh, that Viking, Viking genes, I guess. But, uh, <sighs> That's one of the problems. You have all these people who can have this longer incubation period, apparently, than SARS-1. And um, they can be shedding virus, but not necessarily be ill from it or feel ill. So um, that's how you get uh, community spread or transmission without attribution to a specific source. Well, that's actually a very good lead in uh, since this is a second group here. Um, why don't you tell, in other words, everybody is affected by isolating. And why don't you give them a good idea about what that will do? In other words, uh, why are we doing this? Why should people do this? What are we trying to accomplish by not going out in public and uh, to hospitals unless we're really sick and that sort of thing? Uh, can you give us a good idea of that? Yes. I. Uh described this this morning at uh, in many times in my practice I in a surgical practice ears nose throat head and neck surgery um, and uh, I had cases sometimes that went um, 16 hours uh, during my career I needed intensive care beds for those. I sometimes had to cancel patients or um, had to transfer patients in some cases to other hospitals because ICU beds weren't available. And I've seen times when I went through the emergency room, if I got called in and um, people were uh, in stretchers in the hallways waiting for a hospital bed. In other words, the uh, resources, uh, medical resources, aren't that abundant, and um, which may be one of the reasons in the United States, at least, that they have tried to prevent everybody from having great access to them. Um, but if you have, as I heard someone on um, uh, CNBC, I think it was a, a financial program, I put it on for a few minutes and I and one fellow was saying everybody should just go out and get infected, get it over with, and then the economy can go on. 
kind of a narrow-minded view. And if that happens, then 80% may be fine, but you're going to have 20% that get uh, seriously ill and need uh, higher level um, medical care, including hospitalization. 20% uh, uh, of the people requiring hospitalization right now are 25 to 40, or 20 to 45, that is. Um, so if you have people not acting responsible or responsibly and going ahead and living life as though nothing was going to interfere with their uh, happy times, they're not only putting everyone that they come in contact with at risk, but they're going to uh, further spread this and have faster onset of new cases and the hospitals will be overwhelmed and you may as well be in a wilderness if that happens. Anyone with um, uh, ordinary uh, run of the mill, I'm not downgrading the significance of these uh, problems like cancer, insulin dependent diabetes, heart disease, uh, stroke, uh, they're not even going to be able to be seen. People are going to be triaged for, we'll try to save this one and triage that put them in the tent. And so uh, I, I was encouraging people this morning and I'll encourage all of you as well, be the hero for everyone around you. Be the leader that we need. Everyone should stand up to leadership right now. St step up to leadership and uh, do everything you can to prevent this from spreading too fast. And uh, even if eventually everybody or most everybody ends up uh, getting uh, uh, the infection, at least um, the um, uh, cat catastrophic excessive demands on medical care won't be reached. And you may well have more chance of having a treatment if you yourself get into trouble, and anybody can. There have been teenagers that died of this. And the original uh, physician in China who wrote to colleagues that he thought there was a new virus that was much like SARS-1, and the authorities paid him a visit and made him sign a confession that it was a fraudulent statement and untrue. Uh, he died of coronavirus. He was 34 years old, I think. He's pretty young. So um, so what we're trying to do, as Dr. Hendricks is explaining, is the flatten the curve. You can see the display up there. If, let's say, for example, this were back in 1918 and there were not global communications, there weren't um, antibiotics like we have today, um, or medical facilities like we have today, uh, what would happen then is essentially, like some people have said, it would, uh, and it is an historic moment. I've asked people, uh, like my dad who's 89 and other people, and they've never seen anything like this. This is very different. Of course, there's not a lot of people from 1918 still around, but um, the idea is that if we did not do anything and no one did anything and they went out and did whatever they normally do, is it would probably affect, inf uh, inf it would probably go through the entire population. Back in 1918, as uh, you may have read, uh, that means uh, at that time, 30 or 40 percent of the world um, got infected and 50 to 100 million people died. And even if you think you're healthy and may be able to resist this, uh, that's an awful lot of people that you have helped to uh, infect. So we all have to kind of bear with our individual inconveniences for a time to be able to defeat this thing. Would you agree with that? Yes, 
And I have a couple of comments about the 1918 situation and to distinguish it from our current situation uh, and to emphasize how we can avoid getting in, in as much trouble. Uh, it was toward the end of World War One. One of the major factors, a, a major vector in the spread of this were troop movements, troops being taken from one site to another, um, across countries uh, or across bodies of water and infecting populations. Uh, they said that um, half the British army and, uh, and three fourths of the French army were infected with the influenza virus H1N1. There was another aspect of this. I, I saw Chuck Grassley said uh, uh, the Spanish were never insulted. It was called Spanish flu and it was kind of ignorant because the uh, Spain was neutral in World War I and World War II, and uh, the journalists from France and Britain and uh, probably the United States and such were all being restricted and censured in what they could say. They were um, carefully uh, writing stories to keep a positive, upbeat, tone about how the war was being won and our boys are doing great and all that sort of thing. They did, did not want bad news. The only journalists to speak of that reported on the flu that started to spread and kill so many people were Spanish journalists. And so they called it Spanish flu. There, um, I'm not going to get into there's a uh, another demographic that one Chinese one um, uh, Canadian uh, researcher thinks was the source of as a group of people that were working behind the lines not not in combat that uh, might have been uh, the source of the influenza to everyone else, but there was a, a bacterium called Pfeiffer's. It was a German doctor, Dr. Pfeiffer and Pfeiffer Spaxillus um, that um, they didn't really understand viruses. They didn't know what they were dealing with. Uh, mostly they just had, uh, they had uh, different from this, people 20 to 45, they would be perfectly healthy, no, no problems at all. They would get this and they could be dead in 24 hours, gone and lungs filled with fluid, wretched death. And when they did autopsies, they found Pfeiffer's bacillus. Pfeiffer's bacillus is a Haemophilus influenza bacterium. It, is, it was a co-inhabitant of the pharynx in a lot of people and um, in people that got ARDS and they had, you know, necrosis of all these uh, uh, lining cells in their lung. Um, this was substrate for this bacteria to grow. And this was before penicillin. Uh, this was really before any antibiotics could be used. And um, so they died of horrible pneumonitis and most of the mortality was felt by some to be uh, attributable to a co-infection um, uh, not only with H1N1, but that along with this Haemophilus influenza. Now we have better uh, diagnostic ability and better understanding of uh, the uh, uh, pathophysiology of this whole thing and also better treatment uh, uh, these days. But if it's overwhelmed, uh, you know, it's like having food in the grocery store, but you can't go in and you just starve outside. So we're depending on everyone to, like I said, be responsible and keep your distance socially and uh, doesn't mean to not to look out for each other and reach out to each other and to make sure everyone's okay and have what they need. Um, we'll get through this, but it, it's gonna be psychologically hard on a lot of people, but uh, um, two meters two meters, y'all, yeah, keep your distance physically. It's a new form of politeness. So um, anyway, that's, that's one point I wanted to make about Spanish flu. There's been so many comparisons to it that uh, uh, it, the 
times were different and um, fortunately we're not in a world war like we were back then. And it wasn't until 1930, I think, that Schopf uh, used a Birkenfeld uh, filter, I think it's called, um, which could filter out bacteria and he took filtrates from the um, fluids from inf uh, people who had this infection and showed that the filtrate, which was bacteria free, was still infectious. So they began to understand this isn't a bacterium, this is uh, something smaller that can go through a tiny filter that would block bacteria from spreading. Okay, and why don't we talk a little bit about what people can do? In other words, the idea is that, um, as you mentioned in the first session, is that when somebody has coughed or sneezed, there are very small aerosol particles that do stay in the air for a bit. But in general, it's not really like a, a fog. Um, so you can go out jogging or walking or bicycling or other things provided that you don't touch or inhale uh, particles from infected people. In other words, staying inside, um, absolutely inside, may not be absolutely necessary. Would you agree or how would you state that differently? No, I think that's true. I think you can go outside and it's healthy uh, to do so, especially during daylight. Um, <clears throat> I mentioned this morning I worked in, um, actually before I went to medical school, quite a bit with uh, tuberculosis patients and uh, with a mobile tuberculosis uh, unit that went uh, all about and took x-rays and gave, I gave, I did the x-rays. I was trained to do that and give um, skin tests and also sat with this pulmonologist and read the S chest x-rays um, because he liked me and he knew I was um, going to medical school. So that was, I was already accepted. I just had a job I had. Um, but uh, from reading, even back then, um, eight seconds of ultraviolet, ultraviolet light from daylight will generally kill bacteria in the air, including tuberculosis. Uh, and I would think that it should be effective against viruses. Uh, uh, UV will- well, In the old days, people, people used to hang their laundry out, uh, you know, in, and used to air out things in the sun. <laughs> There, there are some practices which we may have forgotten that uh, may be beneficial. Yeah, although you have to watch for mosquito larvae and things. <laughs> if they're really wet, uh, mosquitoes can lay eggs in them and things like this. Uh, you get uh, the, Yeah, there is that too. <laughs> or where I'm living now, it would uh, your clothes would turn yellow from pine pollen. But... Uh, Generally, if you can leave your windows open and have air exchange in your house, you'll probably be better off. And um, uh, uh, yeah, sitting outside in the, in the sunlight or taking walks is uh, good. And uh, it's a kind of a generic uh, recommendation, but uh, most everything I read includes exercise or being uh, trying to remain fit as a uh, positive factor in survival. Okay, here's a question, actually, Max, if, if Max is still in the audience here. Uh, yeah, she is, okay. Is that my understanding uh, is the virus, uh, which is really small, it's not alive in that it's, um, it needs a host to replicate, which is part of the reason why this helps. It, it can't uh, just sit around uh, it needs a, uh, uh, cells, other cells and humans to uh, replicate. That's one of the, I guess, the bad, good things about viruses. It'll die of it uh, after a while if it just sits around. True or not? Yes. Also, it doesn't uh, take in uh, sources of energy to uh, 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 construct uh, its life processes uh, or support its life processes like cells do and uh, 
higher uh, organisms. Um, it's a thing. Uh, I don't think viruses are alive. They are a thing that gets in and it's, uh, I, I, I made a, an analogy, something I, I woke up this morning thinking about, uh, you know, you, you play, play uh, poker, uh, the an ordinary deck of cards, you've got 13 suits, um, 52 cards. I know we have some people playing with something short of a full deck. Uh, we've all known people like that, but the um, coronavirus is a, a type four uh, virus by the David Baltimore classification from 1979. Generally, viruses are classified according to their genetic machinery, as that's uh, comparative molecular uh, studies, um, like s seeing how close uh, sequences of um, the genome uh, in one organism are to another organism are the best way to know how closely related they are. Um, uh, it has a single long strand of RNA, 30,000 bases. They're not base pairs, it's a single strand, it's positive sense. So if the uh, virus spike can get in contact with the ACE2 receptor and there's a peptidase action there. It has two parts to it. And um, so there's some changes there that are being studied by cryo-electron microscopy, which allows flexible molecules to be um, captured and imaged in all of these different shapes they take um, by um, um, plunge cooling of um, a wet, uh, you, you, you put a small specimen in water and you um, uh, plunge it into supercooled uh, uh, hydrocarbon and it will form uh, like a vitreous or uh, uh, amorphous water uh, 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 environment that basically freezes activity. It doesn't damage the molecules and you can see what they're doing. So at any rate, um, once uh, the uh, virus attaches there and goes through its steps for uh, being taken into the cell and then uh, uncoding, decoding, and C-O-A-T-I-N-G, releasing its one long strand of 30,000 uh, 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 bases, uh, it can start to uh, 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 use your own machinery, your own ribosomes, uh, it, your, your own cells think it's messenger RNA. And the first thing it'll do is to make uh, a couple of proteins that um, uh, act as reverse transcriptase and uh, polymerase. It's an RNA, RNA dependent uh, polymerase that um, it forms in complexes and it forms a mirror image negative strand RNA. And that gets transcribed into two things, a complete RNA genome and also seven or so short um, positive sense messenger RNAs that the, your cells will then start to translate and form viral proteins thinking it's your own. Um, my point in this is life is short. We think in small numbers, whether we like it or not. Um, we can be elegant with finite mathematics um, in theory and with uh, uh, practice and uh, dealing with the probabilities like in poker and such. But nature is playing here with, uh, uh, they're, it's holding a hand of 30,000 cards. And everything that's possible that can happen in nature, if it's physically possible, eventually that roll of the dice will come up. It'll happen. 
however complex. It just it's a matter of time and nature is on a cosmic clock. And we're on our little pathetic, mostly less than a hundred year clock as humans. So this is hard to appreciate, but uh, why is a virus like this show up? Because it can, and because we happen to be here when it does. And one thing we mentioned about this uh, this morning, this is not something to be blamed on any demographic or any particular uh, race, except the human race. I think the race I would uh, uh, blame it on is the human race. It reflects human patterns of uh, how we deal with food and, uh, you know, human expansion into every um, habitat and uh, stealing uh, wild animals out of their habitat that aren't bothering anybody and then cramming them into markets uh, or butchering them with dirty hands and uh, wiping our faces and uh, 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 the bats, if they're brought in, they, uh, they get uh, stressed and uh, will tend to urinate and uh, uh, also, they'll be uh, more inclined to get sick. Uh, there's a lot of cruelty in the way humans handle animals. And if you want to avoid um, uh, this kind of thing happening again, I would recommend um, uh, avoid warm-blooded vertebrates. You don't have to eat them. I don't eat them. And I'm pretty healthy. And... Uh, so at any rate, uh, nature is playing with a huge deck of cards. This virus alone is playing with a, I guess you could say a deck of, uh, it's a, it's a, a hand with 30,000 cards dealt from a deck of uh, 120,000. Uh, that's a, and that's how you get that particular uh, strand of uh, a base bases. So, Aragon's question. Uh, yeah, there's actually a couple of questions. Let me uh, field them. Um, there's one by Max, there's one by Baragon, there's one by a couple other people. Is that, uh, what are the symptoms and what leads to death? In other words, um, the virus, you know, what, what, what in the body leads to death? My understanding, it's, it's mostly pneumonia and stuff, but what, it, what are the symptoms and what leads to death? Okay. The first off symptoms, um, when they occur, um, uh, are generally uh, sore throat. It, it's, it's sort of typical, non-specific upper respiratory symptoms of sore throat. I uh, think so much runny nose, but cough. And uh, if somebody said they had a runny nose too, it wouldn't be surprised. Oftentimes, people with bronchitis have a runny nose simply because they have so much stimulation of their airway and it's it's not a direct effect on uh, it's like a synthetic effect on the nasal mucosa and um, uh, malaise uh, chills uh, cis, uh, constitutional symptoms of fever and uh, uh, indication that your immune system is having a reaction to something you know, there's a difference between uh, the presence of uh, um, a pathogen and having an infection. An infection implies that your your body's immune system is actually reacting to it. Inflammatory response. In some people, this will proceed to um, uh, uh, acute respiratory distress syndrome, as, um, or severe acute respiratory distress, ARDS, or um, SARS, uh, because of massive inflammation, and it's called, since the avian flu of 2009, um, uh, cytokine storm. Cytokines are uh, uh, peptides that they were discovered around 1957, and um, uh, 
lymphocytes were the original source and um, uh, interferons and those sorts of things are, are cytokines. Uh, there are cytokines, uh, their, their purpose is uh, cell to cell signal, signaling. In other words, m messaging from one cell to another. And they are sort of like uh, hormones, uh, like a telephone line or uh, something between specific kinds of cells. And uh, there are pro-inflammatory cytokines. And the response is really marked in some people and will result in um, uh, basically the lungs getting filled with fluid and inability to have gas exchange, which is the fundamental uh, use of the lung tissue for you to have uh, 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 a way for carbon dioxide to get out of your body and fresh oxygen to get in. And if you can't do that, you die pretty quickly. So the, uh, and, and you can go on a ventilator and uh, have um, positive and expiratory pressure and end up on 100% oxygen and uh, uh, get vasopressors like dopamine uh, uh, when you're um, in shock and still die. And it can happen at all kinds of ages. So you want to avoid the infection and you don't want to give it to anybody. If you get it, the reproduction ratio, R0, it's also called R0, is two to three. In other words, every single person on average who gets infected will infect two or three other people. And that's how these pandemics go. If it was a R0 of one, each person infecting one other person, it would not become a pandemic. It would be just a flat curve uh, or a flat prevalence. Uh, but uh, at any rate, the more people that get sick, the more people you can expect to get sick and it'll quickly get out of control because it's got a, it's got an exponential growth. And Max uh, asked earlier, Max asked earlier about whether um, this might be more infectious or effective not if you might be able to catch this more than a DNA virus. Oh, well, this is extremely contagious. It, it seems to have a long incubation period uh, during which people are shedding virus. And so that's how you get this community spread. Um, I think, I don't know if the virulence, you know, it's how many organisms it would take to get a person infected. Uh, I suspect the virulence of this would be pretty high. Um, um, it's probably yeah, sorry, she than actually, a, I'm sorry, uh, she actually asked about the mutation rate. Where do you think that there may be a higher mutation rate be, uh, than other viruses? You know, I wouldn't have thought so, but I saw an article and I, I, I um, I'd want to see more uh, support of this, but uh, in Spain, which has been pretty hard hit, uh, they're talking about it looking like a different virus from what came in, but they can trace the lineage of infections by uh, comparative uh, studies uh, of um, as the um, virus mutates. The virus will do make mistakes and throw it out there. It's, it's producing thousands and millions of virons, uh, virions, I should say, uh, with, uh, you know, every infection. And so if it throws out some uh, mistakes and they happen to um, be more virulent, uh, they'll take off on their own, perhaps. Um, I, I, I can't answer the uh, 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 mutation rate better than that. It's certainly faster than uh, mutation rate as one expects in general evolution uh, because the uh, number of progeny virus are so uh, great. Okay, so another question is, uh, if they don't have a fever, do they still have to be concerned that they could have it? 
Yes, you could have it without a fever. You could be totally asymptomatic. Although there is a, um, uh, a really fascinating uh, thing going on. There's a kensahealth.com. Um, uh, I think it's called, uh, and it, it's a product. They, they sell thermometers. These thermometers are sort of smart thermometers. Uh, they um, are connected to the internet. And so they will track your temperature. And it also goes to the kensahealth.com to database. You can go on kensahealth.com and you can see their map and they will pick up in real time fluctuations uh, that are abnormal in average temperatures. And they can point out where um, something infectious likely is going on. And they're a week ahead of the CDC in being able to do this. Nobody's having to write it down and report it on Friday to the CDC. It's going in real time into this database. And I would encourage everybody just for edification. I'm not pushing a product. I don't own this. I've just found it very interesting. Um, they're for sale like on Amazon, but uh, uh, let's see. Uh, let me see if I can find it here real quickly in a moment. Uh, uh, yeah, otherwise, if you don't have it, I can find it while you're talking. There, okay. I Let's see. When I have... Second Life on my computer won't do anything. If anyone could look up kensahealth.com and see if they can find the uh, 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 website, I'd appreciate it. Uh, uh, but yeah, it's good to track your temperature. If you get a little variation, you may not feel it uh, constitutionally. You might feel fine, but you may have a little bump in your temperature. It brings to mind another thing that bats have wide fluctuations in temperatures. I actually love bats. I think bats are really cool. I uh, had a bat that uh, was in my son's window. Uh, my son's passed away, but I had a feeling like it was him coming back to see me. And uh, he was outside the, uh, uh, their maternal colonies generally, and they're protected animals. They're beneficial animals. They have their own niche and spend a lot of time high up in the air eating bugs that would otherwise maybe uh, sting you or bite you and give you infections and disease. Um, and uh, so uh, at any rate, their body temperature can drop and, and they'll go into torpor where it, when it's really cold, they'll go like hibernate. Uh, but when they go out uh, at a half an hour after sundown, they'll fly out of their little niche and uh, uh, this one liked to go up in this window because it would squeeze up between this, uh, the storm window outside and the screen. The screen was up just a little bit. I always left it up for him um, and liked to go up and see him. And um, uh, when they're flying about, their temperatures can go up to 100, and, uh, the, the equivalent of 105 or 106 uh, degrees Fahrenheit, which is like a high fever. Um, and um, so some infections, a fever will change physiology and make the infection um, have a harder time continuing for this particular virus having uh, originated from bats, as did the original SARS probably. Uh, it came from via civet cats. Civet cats are kind of cool. Uh, they will, they're omnivores and they will eat bats if they can get a hold of them. And uh, apparently in China at the wet markets, uh, they had civet cats that they were um, sometimes would butcher there. And um, that was uh, probably a source of uh, the SARS-1. Uh, but uh, at any rate, uh, this particular virus, which is a beta coronavirus, uh, uh, is uh, happy uh, to continue its processes with higher temperatures. So when a human gets high fever, this virus doesn't care. <laughs> doesn't slow it down a bit. It exists in bats without uh, and, and pretty well tolerated.
Kay, can you talk about uh, what you have read um, uh, regarding touching things? In other words, people have talked about, should I have take out food? Should I, what about money? What about uh, packages from uh, delivery? All of those sorts of things like that. In other words, from a medical standpoint, what would you say? Well, I would think um, if, if you can wash your hands after handling anything, uh, that's going to be um, a, a, a ground basis for staying healthier. Uh, in terms of mail, one thing you could do is open the mail outside and uh, put the envelopes in the recycling bin, or um, but don't handle them, bring them in on your counters and things. Um, and um, uh, you can, um, if you don't have gloves and you're really concerned, uh, you uh, you know going out, you could actually put a bag over your hand, like a plastic bag, and uh, you can mark one side as the outside of it and put it over your hand and then uh, use that to grab a hold of things as needed and put them in so you don't handle them directly if you're really concerned about uh, where you are and what it's a very public place or if you're touching buttons or whatever and then you can turn the bag inside out so that the contaminated side is down inside of there and eventually discard it. Um, there's ways like that just to protect yourself. If you had a little um, uh, rod of some sort, could be almost anything, to, uh, could be a, uh, a piece of plastic from a ballpoint pen, or, uh, and you kept it uh, in a, a bag or a tube with uh, alcohol and a plastic and, and a cotton ball at the bottom so that the tip of it is in the alcohol. The alcohol will kill an enveloped virus like the coronavirus. And you can use that for pushing elevator buttons and such. Um, so there's ways to avoid, but fundamentally, wash your hands, have uh, um, uh, hand sanitizer if you can get it, and uh, uh, wipe down your... Uh, steering wheel and your uh, 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 car handles and things like that. Uh, the areas that are most concerned are porous, uh, like porous countertops, because the virus uh, can uh, get down in there and um, if they don't dry out, they can survive. So- Okay, well, we got other questions here, which are interesting. Okay is uh, the one that a lot of people ask is about uh, surgical masks, including the N95 and, and such. You mentioned that in the earlier presentation about what who should wear masks and... I think health healthcare workers that are directly exposed. Um, I think that if someone's sick and they're out uh, and about um, and they have a cough, they should wear a mask. Almost any kind of mask helps reduce the aerosol. And um, that was one of the points that I learned uh, even back uh, several decades ago uh, when I was uh, involved in taking care of so many tuberculosis patients, which I fortunately never converted. Um, but uh, uh, that uh, everybody wanted to wear a mask to be in around a uh, tuberculosis patient, but the tuberculosis patient was the one who should wear the mask. And I think it's the same thing here. Um, that uh, N95 uh, mask that uh, is kind of an ultra filtration mask uh, to wear it, if it will feel like you're suffocating, but you can survive with it. But it's not a real comfortable thing to have on for very long. And uh, uh, it will help, but it's not fail safe. The other question was, and they said this, it's not a joke, they're wondering if drinking alcohol would uh, kill the virus. My understanding is uh, it has to be about 60% and that would kill you first. Um, yeah, maybe uh, something stronger than whiskey. Um, no, I, I think, um, and, and you know what, uh, and traditionally in bars, uh, people have the drink and uh, leave the glass and the glass gets kind of dipped in soapy water and turned upside down. It's not washed very thoroughly. 
and um, um, uh, people have tolerated that for a long time, uh, to my surprise. Uh, um, but um, um, I would be concerned about that. Uh, just as I, I think you could go to carry out restaurants to help them stay in business uh, and uh, help their employees to have a living uh, during this, because this is going to be a hard time for a lot of people. But go to places you trust where you know they take care of uh, uh, hygiene. But uh, I think surfaces and handling things like public pens and um, pushing the buttons on uh, 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 things that read your credit card and that sort of thing, that's, um, that's a concern. You need to really carefully wash your hands after that. I'm going to field the one. There's a question about how could authorities and governments around the world underestimate the risk for so long. Actually, they haven't. If you have talked to the right people, I mean, I've been reading about uh, a possibility of this for a very long time uh, and what it could do and such like that. Uh, I'm not sure how many people, um, yeah, I'm not sure how many people realize what kind of impact we would have. In other words, how people would react. But uh, kind of everyone knew this was coming, at least as far as scientists goes. Would you agree with that? Uh, Yes, and I noticed that uh, the, um, well, for instance, the uh, people at the CDC tend to not uh, say much about this, but uh, the politicization of this process of, uh, has been uh, criminal. Uh, there are all these people, and, you can just go on social media of any sort and you can find tons of examples of people who uh, speak disparagingly or uh, with disbelief about the coronavirus and they've taken their cue from someone who said it was a hoax for their political convenience um, and even now is being ambiguous about it. Uh, and that's going to cost lives. That's going to cost the, you know, the damage to the economy. That's going to cost misery to people because this whole thing we've lost uh, two months. I've been watching this. I, I, it didn't take all that much to read about it. And there was a report in the federal government in the United States about this coming. And in fact, there was a, um, Report in the news uh, three weeks ago before he sold uh, stock um, of about $1.2 billion, uh, $1 million of stock. Uh, the senator from uh, North Carolina spoke to sponsors that uh, were in a group that were paid $10,000 a, a plate uh, and told them that this was going to have um, uh, immense societal and uh, economic uh, consequences. But he didn't say a word as the top of the government was lying and uh, being obscure and uh, throwing out disinformation. This is a time when we really got to join together. And where there's a vacuum in leadership, well, don't expect it to come late. Uh, you got to be the leader yourself. Be the hero for someone else. You today can help save others by the actions you take. And I think that's what we have to do. Well, that may be a perfect way to end this session. Uh, each of the sessions were intended to only be about 30 minutes. Um, this one's gone to now an hour. And remember that uh, you can go ahead and ask uh, tagline uh, more questions. You can do it by I am. You can ask other people. Uh, we are really in this together. 
okay? And this is one of the best ways to start is by being educated to know the science and not just the rumors. And so I appreciate everybody coming in uh, today and taking their uh, time to uh, join us. Please, this is an international group, please share the information um, and let's all be safe and do what we need to do in order to uh, not, uh, in order to help ourselves and to help our communities. I'd like to add one last comment. And we discussed this this morning. Can you still hear me? Oh yeah, please go ahead. Oh, okay. Um, I, I've had personal loss due to suicide. And this is going to be a terrible, traumatic time emotionally for a lot of people. And I want to encourage you to watch out for your fellow human being, your families and your friends and your neighbors and people you don't know. If you sense that somebody's despondent or you get the vibes that they are sinking, do something, talk to them, interact with them, um, show you care, show some love, and you may save their life. It'd be tragic for people to take their lives out of despondency because of all this, even uh, when people are dying of, you know, actual, you know, physical disease and infection, uh, it's just going to be hard on people. And there are going to be a lot of losses. There was a gentleman, uh, Dr. Schwartz, at uh, Stephen Schwartz at, um, he was an MD, PhD at the University of Washington who died yesterday and he had been there as in the Department of Pathology since 1967 and uh, was um, a contributor to uh, research on cardiovascular disease and things like that. But uh, he was 78, but even though he was 78, he still carried a lot of experience, life experience, knowledge, and had a lot to offer. And he's gone. He died yesterday of coronavirus. So we're going to have to hold it together and carry on. Uh, but watch out for your fellow man. Show some love. That's all I know. Thank you, Tagline. Dr. Hendricks. Thank you. <laughs> now we've all got our what? We've got our uh, alter egos here in our first life. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Avatars and. I appreciate everyone's attendance and your interests. And uh, um, I'm honored to have been invited to speak to you. And uh, I've been honored to work with uh, Vic here, uh, or Phil, uh, as a team on this presentation. So uh, uh, this is a magnificent gathering uh, place. And I think that, uh, especially in this time of increased social isolation, uh, things like Science Circle are a beacon, a point of light on the hill. So we can be proud of it. Okay, and if you haven't seen everything on the island, <laughs> now's the time to do it. We're looking forward to the uh, virtual world's best practice education events uh, starting March 26th and to the other uh, pre and post conferences. Uh, so enjoy. Thank you. And if you have anything, share it with us too, as far as uh, places to go and see and uh, if other people have information on this. Uh, that's the value of this place. It's very global. It's very uh, sharing educational uh, place. Take care, be safe, and um, do something to uh, you know, for yourself and for others, enjoy life.
I'll add one other thing. Uh, on the 4th of April, uh, uh, Vic and I are presenting an update on coronavirus. That's Saturday, and, and that will be 10 o'clock uh, PDT, Pacific uh, Daytime. Uh, and uh, you're welcome to come. I'm going to speak more about uh, the molecular uh, mechanisms of uh, attachment and replication and uh, some about uh, strategies for treatment that might arise from knowing how this virus attacks us. So any other questions or I'm going to turn off my mic. Ariane, as history has shown, uh, you can see the display above us is there have been pandemics for thousands of years and they've always been overcome and uh, society may have been changed, but um, the human race is pretty resilient. Uh, so yes, of course, we'll overcome this if we uh, do it together. Uh, just we're not sure about when, as someone asked earlier, or what it will look like afterwards. Yeah, I, Ariane, I too hope that the Olympic Games uh, goes on. We have no idea right now, of course, how long things are going to be. Uh, I think that's probably one of the big anxiety things is we don't know as far as um, how long this will be, how long individuals will need to be isolated, uh, what, um, how long economic situations uh, will be impacted, but uh, it'll be very interesting to see. And we're all living it together. <laughs> 